thank you very much, uh, Mike, for those very warm words of introduction. Uh, it's uh, truly a pleasure to be here, and I'm very honored uh, to be part of this conversation with uh, the elected representatives that you all are from your respective countries. Uh, I really also want to express my appreciation to the Africa Center for Strategic Studies for carving out this special program for members of parliament or legislators um, so that you can have the space, uh, the free space outside of your respective countries and outside of your daily responsibilities to engage in a brainstorming exercise, build networks and establish relationships with your colleagues from other countries uh, so as to better position yourselves to carry out your responsibilities as the elected representatives of the people. In fact, when I got this invitation, I was very excited about it because I think that um, members of parliament, uh, elected representatives are the unsung heroes or the unmet promise of Africa's uh, democratization process. Uh, because I remember that in the early 90s, as African countries went through uh, the wave of democratization, uh, that there was a lot of excitement and enthusiasm about the emergence of parliaments that could exercise the proper oversight over the executive branch of government, uh, parliaments that could really legislate and bring about innovative solutions to the problems of African peoples, and parliaments that could also speak on behalf of their constituents. Of course, uh, now into the third decade, uh, there are open questions as to how effective African parliaments have been. And we all are aware of the fact that enthusiasm alone doesn't get the job done, that all too often you all face challenges that make it incredibly difficult for you to meet up your responsibilities. I recognize as someone who works on these issues or who's worked on these issues for the past uh, two and a half decades, that parliaments constitute the place par excellence, the lieu par excellence of democratic practice. Uh, because you represent, that's where the diversity of the country's population is found. Uh, that's where decisions get made about the allocation of resources at the national level. And that's where constituents feel a connection between what they do at the, at the grassroots level, their day-to-day -day survival at the grassroots level, and decisions that get made by policymakers at the national level. Moreover, as we have seen in, in the past few years, as many African countries face new security challenges and experience new vulnerabilities, we're discovering that the nature of security threats on the African continent um, as such that parliaments also have a prominent role to play, that the role of providing security and defense is no longer a role that can be reserved solely for the executive branch or for people in uniform, but it is a role that, in, that requires or calls for citizen engagement and what other path does exist for that level of engagement if you don't, if it's not working with members of parliament. In to, for today's discussion, I received uh, specific instructions from ACSS to kind of uh, zero in on very specific issues that may have come up in your previous conversations. Uh, the first one to deal with the kinds of tools and procedures that would be most relevant uh, for members of parliament or for legislators at large as they um, undertake their responsibilities. Uh, the first tool that comes to mind, and I'm drawing on the work that I and, and my organization, the National Democratic Institute, has done across um, Africa in the past uh, two, three decades. Uh, one of the tools that has come or comes to the fore is the ability of members of the legislature or the legislative branch of government uh, to use legislative hearings or parliamentary hearings as an opportunity uh, to make your, to have your vote points taken into consideration. Of course, I should have prefaced this also by saying that in the democratic dispensation, 
the groundwork has been laid by the constitutions that many of your countries have already adopted in this new democratic dispensation. The fact that in every constitution, there is an acknowledgement of the role of the legislative branch of government as a co-equal branch of government with the executive branch. The fact that these constitutions, as progressive as they are, provide a framework which theoretically already creates the space and makes provisions for the resources that you need to be able to uh, conduct your activities. I'm also building on the fact that because you are lawmakers, as you write your own rules and procedures of your various legislatures, whether they're unicameral national assemblies or the bicameral Senate and House, that you make provisions that allow you to be able to function effectively as a legislative or a co-equal branch of government. That based on this, the tools that we can now discuss um, are underpinned in the principle that in this new democratic dispensation, you do have the authority and there's an expectation on the part of citizens that you will be able to better, uh, uh, to best represent their interests. So one of the first tools that comes to mind is the tool of legislative hearings. That in many countries, when members of parliament can summon experts, whether they're within government, in the executive branch of government, or outside of government, within civil society, and within academia, that you have the possibility of summoning these experts for hearings, public hearings that can help inform the public and enrich the knowledge on the subject matter in question, or even hearings in camera during which you may be able to delve into areas that are protected by confidentiality, but still allow you as elected representatives of the people to be able to be better informed on issues pertaining to the country's interest national interest and secur the security and well-being of its citizens. I also think about site visits, um, which you would wish members of parliament took advantage of, which is an opportunity for you to actually leave the capital city, travel outside of the capital into the remote areas, into the rural areas of the country, and sit down with constituents and citizens to hear directly from them what their concerns are and what they expect of policy makers. This is a tool that the executive branch may not have as much advantage of as you do, uh, but this is a tool that can serve the members of parliament in expanding your base of support within the country when citizens know that they can relate to their members of, of parliament and they can report or engage with them directly in expressing to them how they feel about national policy or sharing with these members uh, the issues that are most of concern to them. I would share with you uh, two examples how this could be very useful. Um, I know we have participants here from Mali, uh, but I, and I know that Mali is a country which unfortunately today is grappling with a number of challenges. Uh, but in the 1990s, in the first decade of democratization, uh, Mali was seen as the champion in terms of helping consolidate democratic governance. And one of the things that, uh, Mali, that I saw in Mali at the time was an, a series of hearings and consultations on issues pertaining to security, going out to citizens and getting their input in terms of how secure they felt, how the relationship, how they felt about the relationship between the military and security, uh, the military security services and ordinary citizens. And one, what came out of this series of hearings in Mali uh, was uh, uh, the adoption of a code of conduct for the security services, which was then summarized in a law book, which every Malian soldier, gendarme, or police had in their pocket to show their commitment to conducting themselves professionally in a way that could help provide human security to the Malian citizens. And this was a very commended effort, but it came out of this, this uh, type of outreach to citizens that brought citizens into the discussions about security. More recently, uh, about two or three years ago, our organization, the National Democratic Institute, worked with members of parliament in Niger. 
Uh, as many of you know, Niger is a country that oftentimes is rated as a country that's not well endowed, uh, but it's a country that's very committed to endowed, not very well endowed, uh, but it's a country that's also noted because the citizens have shown a strong commitment to democratic governance. And that every time that the government of the day has uh, been interrupted through an intervention of the military, that the population has rallied around and has insisted on a trans transition that would allow the country to return to democratic rule. Many of you would also know that in recent years, Mali has also, thanks to new technology, began to exploit a lot of resources, a lot of natural resources that could enhance its resource base and allow the country to be able to undertake policies that could improve the well-being of its citizens. Mali is known as one of the highest, if not the first country in terms of uh, re uranium production in the world. Um, it's also in recent years discovered oil and has now become an oil producing country. And so NDI and members of parliament of Niger embarked on um, site visits to some of the mining sites in the country, mining sites that were being run by foreign companies, notably Chinese companies. And what this uh, site visits did was to provide an opportunity for members of parliament to go in the communities that, have mine, that are mining sites, to talk to citizens about living conditions in the sites, to talk to citizens who are employed in this, by these companies about the working conditions in this site, and then to come back to National Assembly and enact legislation that would help improve the business climate, but also improve the working conditions of Nigerian citizens, as well as the hygienic conditions, such that citizens living in villages around these mining sites would not be negatively impacted by the industrial effect of mining in those communities. What this site visits also did was that it enhanced in the eyes of the Nigerian people the role of their members of parliament and the role of the National Assembly. Because in a democratic dispensation, you also have the responsibility to build a constituency for yourself. And so, irrespective of what is, or despite what is provided for in the constitution of the country, despite what you may write in your rules of procedure as a legislative body of government, you also need to be expanding your constituency to be able to give yourselves the leeway to be able to implement what it is you have decided as elected members should be your priorities. Because the legislative, the executive branch of government, which has all the expertise and the talent in the country, and which in the past, before the democratic dispensation, felt that they had the monopoly of political power in the country, isn't going to cede that power to you willingly. Even if you're from the same political party, let alone if you're from an opposing political party. So it is almost incumbent for you as members of the National Assembly to build your own constituency within the country that can allow you to have the influence that citizens expect of you and that you would like to have for yourselves within that democratic setup. And we found in this Nigerian experience that the sites visits were extremely important for members of parliament. One of the responsibilities of members is to exercise, to vote the budget because it's a law, and then to exercise oversight over the budget in terms of how the executive branch of government gets to spend down on the budget. But we also cognizant of the fact that in a lot of countries, the budget bill is presented to members of parliament a few days before they're called upon to vote on it. It is a huge document with a lot of facts and figures, and members of parliament are not staffed enough to be able to have the time to actually dissect the provisions of the bill before you're called upon to vote on it. And so that's a major challenge. But 
when Nigeria, a country that all of you in this room know because of its sheer size uh, on the continent, when Nigeria made the transition from military rule to civilian democratic rule in 1999, one of the first things that that newly elected legislature, the newly elected members and senators came raised to us as one of the priorities was they wanted to have a budget office for the National Assembly of Nigeria that would help elected members grapple with the budget bill, not just in terms of enacting legislation on the budget, adopting the budget for the country, but also in enhancing its capacity to be able to exercise oversight. And so we worked with the Nigerian legislators to set up a budget office. And right now, the Nigerian National Assembly has an independent budget office that works solely at the behest of the National Assembly of Nigeria. This budget office is then staffed with experts in finance, in management, in other thematic areas who do the work to prepare the members of, pilot of the National Assembly to be able to analyze the budget bill when they get it. The, the budget office does the analysis for the members and gives them talking points or gives them responses that would allow them either to question various ministers from the line ministries during the hearings or also adopt their own positions in terms of how they can exercise oversight over the budget. This is an institution that the National Assembly created for itself because it felt that this institution could help it exercise its function with regards to the national budget. I bring this up because it was done in Nigeria, but it could also be done in other African countries. Because all too often, we have run into members of parliament who have complained about the lack of resources. And my response to them has always been what the Francophones are francophone participants who know so well. You cannot afford to be Le Chardonnier Mar Chaussé. You cannot afford to be the shoe mender who wears a badly made pair of shoes. You have the power of the press. You have control over the budget. It's incumbent on you to be able to, as you put together the national budget, to be able to figure out what the budgetary needs of the National Assembly could be and how you can put in place institutions within the National Assembly answerable to you all as members of the legislature, legislature that can allow you to better perform your duties. Uh, let me also talk about how you deal with some of these challenges that you face as members. One of the challenges that has been brought forward all too often is the challenge of being under-resourced in terms of human resources. You don't have staff. You don't have a committee staff for the, the committees to which you are assigned. You don't even have personal staff assigned to the members. And I know that all too often when legislators come from the continent and get to visit the US uh, Congress, they're sometimes overwhelmed by the number of staff people that staff the various committees or staff the members. Um, and this is a, a recurrent uh, complaint that comes up um, through my own work across the continent. And one of the recommendations that I make to members is that we can transform the fact that on the African continent we have a lot of well-educated people who are not employed. We can transform that into an opportunity through internships. Nothing stops the National Assembly from creating an internship for young graduates who can spend a year or two of national service doing research for members of parliament. Um, nothing stops the, uh, the members from also asking to be briefed on a regular basis by thematic experts in various areas. For example, we know that the Sahel or the countries in the Sahel are faced currently facing issues of violent extremism in the Sahel. We do not expect all members of the National Assembly uh, to become experts in terrorism or in countering terrorism and violent extremism. But nothing stops committee members from inviting experts to brief them on a regular basis on that phenomenon 
and steps that are being taken by the country and other countries and other partners to help those countries grapple with that new challenge. If you create an internship that is recognized by the universities of the country and by the public service, then you can create an opportunity where you get staffed for an extended period of time by people who can help you in your daily responsibilities, do research on the topics that you have to deal with in your committee assignments or the, country, the topics in which you want to be able to develop personal expertise, which is what is going to earn you the respect of your constituents and members of the executive branch of government. You also have, as elected members, the right to summon representatives of the executive branch to testify before your committees, either publicly or in, com uh, in private sessions, to give you, to share with you uh, their own knowledge on the issues that you deal with. Uh, in the interest of time, let me speed up uh, to talk about how you can connect with constituents. Um, because that is the third leg of the tool of legislative work, uh, your responsibility to your constituents. You serve as a middle, as the middle man or middle woman, the person, the go-to person for constituents because they have more proximity to you than they have uh, to the central government. As we speak, um, I will go again to the Sahel and talk about uh, the recent crisis that Mali has experienced with some of the, um, with the killings of over 100 citizens in the central part of Mali uh, due to ethnic tensions, but a fallout of the uh, violent extremism that Mali has been struggling with in the northern part of the country and as well as in the central part of the country. Can you just imagine for a second if the parliament of Mali uh, sent a parliamentary delegation to those areas to visit with the citizens and to hear from them what the ethnic tensions, what are the origins of the ethnic tensions, and then to come back into the capital city and work through legislation that can foster cohabitation amongst the diverse populations of the country. I take that example because it's recent, but I'm sure that if you go through the challenges that many of your countries face, there have been instances when issues have arisen in states or in provinces of the country in which the, to which the executive branch of government has responded, but in which the, the legislative branch hasn't responded as well, and that has created a gap between citizens and their elected officials. Let me also talk about um, the parliamentary in inquiries. Um, that you do have the latitude and the liberty to be able to undertake, um, and which, is, which could also be one way for you to build the confidence of citizens that they have an opportunity to be able to transmit their grievances to their elected representatives. The bottom line in what I just explained is the need for members of parliament to not isolate themselves to not rely solely on the Constitution and what has been written in the Constitution or in their own rules of procedure, but to find ways of reaching out to other advocates of democracy and democratic governance, civil society, academics, the media, and realize that you are going to have to build your own constituency within the country that allows you to influence how policy is formulated and how it is executed. Uh, let me just end with the last question that was raised in terms of if I were a member of parliament and my country is deploying troops on a peacekeeping mission outside of the country, what is the one question that I would want to ask? And my one question would be, or a two-part question, I would like the Minister of Defense to explain to me and to brief me and my committee on the mandate of the troops being deployed, because one of the things that we've seen across peacekeeping forces on the continent is that when there is an ambivalence about their mandate or when the mandate doesn't match the realities on the ground in the countries in which they are deployed, all too often the troops that are deployed become ineffective in conducting themselves and end up sometimes taking casualties which their home governments and the home countries are going to have to deal with. 
So as a member of parliament, I would want to know whether they're deploying on a chapter seven mandate, in which case they can fight back, or whether they're being deployed on a chapter six mandate, and if so, whether there's already peace existing in the deployment theater, such that when they are deployed, they wouldn't take casualties. Because it's imp incumbent on me as a member of parliament to look after the well-being of troops being deployed during the deployment, as well as when they return to the host country. Uh, there's definitely a lot more to talk about, but I would like to end my opening remarks here, hoping that when we get into the question and answer, we'll have ample opportunity to delve further into uh, the issues that could be of particular interest to each and every one of you. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you.